you've been here before. Sure you have. Sure, I never forget a face. Come on over here. Let me shake your hand. Tell you something. I recognized you by the way you walk even before I saw your face good. You couldn't have picked a better day to come back to Castle Rock. I love this book, you guys. <laughs> hey friends, my name is Miranda. Welcome to my universe. I have to show off my Needful Things shirt. My mom got it for me, and I think it's one of the most beautiful things I've seen in my life. <laughs> Today, we are venturing into the fictional town of Castle Rock, Maine to go shopping for, how do you say, antiques? I have a few housekeeping things that we need to take care of before I get started with this video. And number one is that this video will be absolutely saturated with spoilers. There is no way that I could even begin discussing this book without actually going into detail about the things that happen. This book has so many deep and hidden meanings that honestly to just gloss over them would feel like a sin. If you want a normal book review with no spoilers and actually just talks about the plot and how someone feels about it, you might want to go somewhere else, my friend. Here I am analyzing the incredible artwork. Truly, this book is a piece of art. Like, I, I will die on this hill. However, if you don't care about spoilers, but you might be thinking to yourself, Miranda, I haven't read this book before. Am I going to be completely lost throughout this entire video? Fear not. I will be describing to you in just very small details what goes on in this book as I go along with my analyzation. That leads me to point number two, though, that there is a major content warning. Like, I think this book is the most graphic book I've ever read in my life. Horrifying things happen in this book. If you are triggered by anything, I don't care what it is. If there is something on this planet that triggers you, I would bet money that it is inside this book. So please, fair warning if you decide to actually read this book and fair warning going into this video. I do my best to make my videos family friendly and as PG, PG-13 as possible, but it was very hard with this book and I might have to say and talk about some really heavy topics that not every viewer would be comfortable with. So fair warning. And then lastly, number three, I feel the need to explain my viewpoint and where I came from when I was reading this book and how I gleaned the information that I did from this book. Everybody learns things differently and they find different things in what they experience. My point of view going into this book heavily weighs upon the Christian worldview. So that being said, the reason why I think this book is an allegory for Satan and sin and temptation and what happens when you give in to temptation, that all comes from my Christian worldview perspective. This video isn't to preach at you and this video is most certainly not to convince you of what I believe in. What I'm doing with this video is explaining to you everything that I saw in this book that definitely is not something you would see if you were just light reading this book. If you were reading this story with exactly what the words say, you wouldn't get the hidden and deeper meanings, which is what an allegory is. An allegory is a story that tells a completely different story hidden in the words and in the content that the book actually produces. Here is this hunk of tree, seven, 800 pages. Let's get into it. We begin this magnificent story in the small fictional town of Castle Rock, Maine, and a new store is opening up. The man who runs this store is named Leland Gaunt, right here, <laughs> and his shop sells curiosities, seemingly useless items that actually show themselves to people as the thing that they want the most in life. Whenever somebody sees an item that catches their eye, they cannot stop obsessing about it. It overtakes everything. They cannot go to bed because they are constantly thinking about this item that they didn't know they needed until they saw it. Eventually, everyone who enters Needful Things ends up buying something from Needful Things. But here is the catch. There are two prices for every item. The cash price and a deed. The deed is always a little prank as he says it, 
but every single person who purchases an item has to go and pull a prank on someone else who lives in their town. This makes it very easy for Leland Gaunt to manipulate them and pull pranks that in the moment seem very innocent, but really end up destroying the lives of the people in Castle Rock. This entire book just explores the different lives of the people in Castle Rock. This actually, there's a lot of characters in here and at some points it becomes very confusing because you have to kind of keep track mentally of who is who and who is pulling what prank on who and how that connects to them. It's like this whole elaborate system and one of the reasons why I think Leland Gaunt, the, the main guy who is running Needful Things, is Satan. But more on that later. The town slowly falls into more and more desolation as the book goes on, more confusion and chaos, until at the very end, the town ends with explosions. Of course, as this is written by Stephen King, the novel has to end in fire or water, does it not? Now that you know the basics on what Needful Things is about, that's kind of your spoiler-free but still spoilery because I kind of told you how it ends. Anyways, now that you know the outside of this story, let's get into the meat and bones. All right. The first thing that I think actually gets more and more obvious as the story goes on is that Leland Gaunt is Satan. I could totally be wrong. I actually probably should have said this at the beginning of the video, but I'll say it right now. Just because I think that everything I'm saying is what the book is trying to imply, that does not mean I'm correct. I am not Stephen King. I did not write this story. I am just gleaning from it what I came to understand from the book. This is not fact. This is just my opinion. This is just Miranda and what she thinks this book is trying to say. Let's continue. There are multiple reasons why I believe Gaunt is Satan. Number one being that he knows all of the citizens' weaknesses and their temptations. What does Satan in the Bible do? He steals, kills, and destroys. Leland Gaunt does the same thing. He steals the town's peace and prosperity by manipulating people's lives and killing people. He literally turns people against each other. So many people die in this book by the hands of other people who just fell into temptation like they did. He kills because, you know, what I just said. <laughs> and he destroys because the town literally explodes by the end of this book because of him. He uses all of these people in the town to do his dirty work and he leaves with all the souls in a suitcase. But his plans don't actually work out for him in the end. More on that later. Most of the people who actually leave Needful Things with the item they purchased realize that they don't really remember exactly what Gaunt asked them to do until he speaks in their minds. Come on, somebody. Satan talks to us through our thoughts, does he not? You have to be careful who you listen to because sometimes the devil just sneaks in there and he says, oh, you're worthless. Oh, you're unworthy. Oh, you bought this from me. You, you, you got this. You had to have this item. So now you have to pay the full price. Go and throw rocks through your neighbor's window. Go and leave a, an innocent little note in someone's car. Just do it. It wouldn't hurt them. It won't hurt them. And then a hundred pages later, boom, it ends up killing them. I find it very interesting because all of the favors that Leland Gaunt asks from these people feeds off of the weaknesses of the townsfolk and what they are already doing. For example, one, <laughs> oh, I can't even talk about this. I won't actually say what he does, but there is somebody who buys very disgusting magazines and he is the middle school principal. And what Leland has somebody else do is go into his office, collect the magazines that he has in a drawer, so stupid, and put them all over his office to be found by some of the school's other staff. In life, we have a lot of baggage. We have a lot of things we're dealing with, a lot of um, sins that we don't like to talk about, right? Things we dabble in, whether that's drugs, alcoholism, yada, yada, yada. We kind of just push it off to the side. We don't really talk about it until it is brought into the light and exposed for what it is. Now, from the Christian perspective, God brings all of our sins and darkness into the light, but he does it in a way that it ends up glorifying him and he turns the wrong to right. 
in this case, in Satan's case, he takes all of our sin and our gross disgustingness, right? All the bad things that we've done in our life and the things that we're ashamed of. He brings that out into the light and uses it to make us feel unworthy and make us feel even worse about ourselves. This leads me to another story that absolutely breaks my heart and made me cry the hardest. The very first character we meet is an 11 year old boy named Brian Rusk who loves collecting baseball cards. He's actually the very first customer of Needful Things and he walks in out of curiosity and ends up buying the super rare baseball card. He ends up committing two crimes, crimes, kind of crimes, a little bit. Well, vandalism was the first one because he threw rocks into this woman's house. And the second one was also kind of vandalism and trespassing because he threw mud on people's sheets that were hanging out to dry outside. So I guess, yeah, crimes. He sends Brian out to do these two crimes because he has to pay for the baseball card that he had to have. And then later on in the story, he finds out that the woman he played the pranks on ended up dying in a fight with another woman. And then of course, at the end of the day, Brian feels as though he is responsible for that murder. He ends up dying horrifically and by his own hand in front of his younger brother. This is where it gets really heavy. In the case of Brian, that is an example of guilt to the extent where this 11 year old boy felt as though it was inescapable. He was helpless. He started this terrible, awful cycle and he couldn't get out of it. And so he did the only thing that he felt like he could do. And that is a case of Satan twisting and distorting our views to the point where we feel as though the things we have done, we can escape the consequences. When in reality, Jesus did die on the cross for us and took all of the burdens on him. Ah, I just wanna cry. For Brian. He doesn't even exist, but like that is what happens in real life and it's just so heartbreaking. I also want to talk about our main protagonist. His name is Alan Pangborn and he is the sheriff in Castle Rock. Alan is the only person who does not go into needful things until the very very end of the novel. He is the person who ends up absolutely demolishing Leland Gaunt's plans in the end. And Leland knows that. He never wants to speak to Alan. He puts up closed signs in the door every single time Alan comes to visit. Almost like he knows when people are coming to visit. So every time Alan tries to visit Needful Things to see what all the hubbub is about, he is always turned down. Why? Because Satan knows that he is the one who is going to destroy his plans and he knows if he was to put himself out there and try to manipulate and use Alan, Alan will overcome it. Just as he overcomes it at the very, very end. Oh boy, oh boy. Another very important aspect of the story that I feel needs to be addressed is that the things that these people are buying are not what they appear to be. Very heavy emphasis on useless items because that is exactly what they are. Brian's baseball card that he had to have, the really rare one that was signed, that was just a piece of paper with a random baseball player printed on it. But because of Gaunt's tactics, he makes the items appear as though they are the most beautiful thing the person has ever seen. He knows what these people want. He feeds off of that desire and presents to them something that they think they need. They, they see that thing and they say, that is exactly what I've been looking for in life. But then once they get a hold of it, and once they actually do what Leland wanted them to do, they end up coming away from that unfulfilled and with a crumpled piece of paper. Another example of this would be in the case of Polly Chalmers, who is dating Alan Pangborn, our main protagonist. Polly has arthritis in her hands and it gets worse and worse as her life goes on. She's only in her 40s or 50s, I believe. She walks into needful things with this excruciating pain that she can barely deal with. And she's tried everything, everything to get rid of it. And of course, Leland Gaunt knows that. And the minute he sees Polly, he says, I know exactly what you need and it will take your pain away. I actually think her story is very incredible and it was one of the ones that stuck out to me the most after Brian's story. She is given a necklace with a stone on it and the stone moves. She doesn't think about that because 
Whenever she wears it, her pain goes away and she feels as though her hands are better than they were even before she had arthritis. So she doesn't give it a second thought that there's a, there might be a little creature crawling around in that stone. She trusted a almost complete stranger instead of trusting Alan. And she realizes that she messed up. After this realization, she grabs the necklace, rips it off and throws that thing and it breaks open and there is a little spider in it. What does the spider do? It doesn't just stay there, no, no, it grows. This is actually a quote from the book regarding the spider. It says, it was feeding on the poison it had sucked out of her body. So the poison, which is her arthritis, it was taking it away, but it wasn't necessarily taking it away for good. She realized the pain, the physical pain, was worth it if it meant she didn't have any pain in her heart and in her spirit. And I know that might sound cheesy, but bro, that hits so hard. Would you rather be in physical pain or mental and spiritual pain? Some food for thought. I just think this book did a wonderful job of expressing how temptation can overtake your behaviors and your life if you're not careful. Satan is just a crouching lion waiting for an attack. And the second you slip up, the second you give in to temptation, he grabs a foothold. Fight against it. You have to fight against it. This novel ends with Alan, Polly, and Norris Widgwick. Ridgewick. Ridgewick. Oh my gosh, these character names are making me go crazy. Norris is one of the deputies, so he works closely with Alan. And his story is very interesting too. I won't go into too much detail. But after realizing what he had done, he tries to himself... And he ended up realizing what was happening. And he realized that, oh my gosh, this all was because of a stupid fishing rod that I had to have. But in reality, it's just a piece of wood. And he actually ends up turning his life completely around, his state of mind completely around. And he plays a very key role in Leland Gaunt's defeat in Castle Rock. So it's Norris, Alan, and Polly, and they end up defeating Leland with, this is what's crazy, a snake. The symbolic animal that represents Satan is what defeated him. But what is incredibly interesting about that is it was a toy snake. It was a snake that Alan's son used to play with and when he threw this toy snake at Leland, he believed that it would come to life, and it did. If you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can move mountains. That is the exact opposite of what Leland has been serving to all of these people. He has been selling people literal pieces of trash, making them believe that it was their wildest dream. But in the case of what actually killed Leland Gaunt is something that was just a toy that came to life and ended up being what led to Leland Gaunt's demise. It is so, guys, I could nerd out forever about this book. And then Alan ends up basically exorcising Leland Gaunt from his town, sending him off to ride his dark horse away off to find another little town to manipulate. Because you can't defeat Satan, can you? You're only human. You can only push him off. Resist the devil and he will flee. They resisted and so he fleed, but he goes to find somebody else to manipulate. And thus, this novel ends the same way it begins with, you've been here before. I'm not joking, ready? You've been here before? It ends that same exact way. These people's stories are so intricate and complex that it makes you feel as though these people are real. And that is what is truly horrifying about needful things is human nature when it comes to what you really want and the things that you will do to achieve and obtain those things that you want, even at the demise of yourself and other people. And with all of that being said, I think I am done talking about this novel for now. If you, if any of you have read the book 
and you have any thoughts disagreeing or agreeing with me i welcome all comments i would like any criticisms at all please comment them down below and i would love to chit chat with you guys thank you so much for watching and for all of your love and support please be safe make good choices and i will see you next time bye also have a very merry christmas don't forget to watch the best christmas movie ever and that is the shining